A very good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time within your busy schedules and joining us for the CHS Open House 2022. I just wanted to inform you that we will be commencing our program soon. A very good morning, everybody, and welcome to the CHS Open House 2022. My name is Sudarshan, an NUS South Asian Studies major, and I will be your MC for today. We will begin our program in a moment, but before that, allow me to share some useful details with you. So firstly, if you would like to find out more about the College of Humanities and Sciences, you can visit the CHS website at CHS .nus.edu.sg. My colleagues will be pasting the link in the chat shortly. Also later, we will be taking questions, so do use the Zoom Q&A function. Simply click the Q&A tab and you will be able to ask questions as well as view other questions that have been asked. And without further ado, to kickstart our CHS event, we are excited to hear from our co-deans, Professor Lionel Wee and Professor Sun Yen Nang. I will now pass the time over to them. Professors, please. Good morning, and thank you for joining the CHS Virtual Open House. And we hope you'll find today engaging and informative to help you finalize your degree of choice. Our College of Humanities and Sciences represents the very best of the humanities and sciences. Our aim is to prepare you for a constantly changing world. By the time you graduate, the world will be even more complex. Allow me to share some examples. The past few months, the spotlight has been on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It has significantly changed the world in more ways than most of us realize. It's impacted global, regional, and national security, food and energy supplies, as well as political and economic stability. Other issues like responding to climate change, trying to eradicate poverty, or reducing social inequality are just as, if not even more complex. Rising to meet the challenges posed by these issues often requires interdisciplinary planning, cross-industry transnational collaboration involving public and private enterprises. Educating and training leaders and citizens who are not only aware, but who are able to successfully navigate these complex challenges is exactly why the NUS College of Humanities and Sciences was established and what the CHS curriculum has been developed for. The CHS core curriculum will expand your learning abilities, enhance your ability to think, synthesize and integrate knowledge and insights across different disciplines. These are integral to solving complex problems. And it is our goal to help you to become adaptable, resilient and empathetic. These are all attributes that will help you to flourish in a complex world. I look forward very much to welcoming you to the CHS and the NUS community. Allow me now to pass the floor to the co-dean, Professor Sun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Wee. A very good morning, students and parents. As you would probably know by now, the specially curated CHS learning curricula is student-led and offers the unprecedented flexibility of having the option to choose from three cross-disciplinary programs, around 30 primary majors, 30 uh, uh, second majors, about 70 minors, 
and close to 20 specializations offered by two of NUS largest and most established faculties, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Science. How is this beneficial to the students? By providing you access to the expertise and the facilities of both faculties, you will be able to chart your own unique learning journeys based on your interests, aptitudes, and aspirations. You can choose to specialize or build expertise in multiple disciplines, pair complementary domains, and leverage the synergies between the two, opening up new world of possibilities in the process. At the end of your academic journey, you will be well equipped to tackle the challenge of today's vocal world. Okay, let me try. Vocal means volatile, U means uncertain, C means complex, A means ambiguous, <laughs> with a better capacity for the lockdown learning. This is of particular importance as the world we live, live in move at a rapid pace, making traditional jobs obsolete faster while previously non-existent occupation or rules continue to emerge. Moving ahead, CHS will continue to widen and enhance our suite of academic offerings so that students can gain more exposure and develop skills to integrate knowledge and insights across different disciplines, which are highly valued by employers. We look forward to seeing all of you in the upcoming academic year here at CHS. I shall now invite our vice deans to share more on this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard and um, So we're gonna be sharing with you uh, in the audience here and of course online as well on the NUS College of Humanities and Sciences and uh, I'm Prof. Loy from the Department of Philosophy, but otherwise my day job, I'm a Vice Dean of, uh, of FASS and my colleague here is... My name is So Chong Hao, I'm a Prof. from the Physics Department. Uh, my role here is I'm a Vice Dean uh, in charge of outreach and admissions. Yeah, so if, if you have seen earlier outreach uh, videos and, and other sessions, you would you'll notice that it's the same two phases. Uh. We've been doing this for how many months by now, Chong uh, Hao? Many, uh, many months by now already. Many, many, many. <laughs> Cannot count already. Yeah, lost count. <laughs> Yeah, so we have been doing this and uh, we really enjoy doing it and we want to make sure that you understand uh, where, what, what this whole program um, is like. We can't give you all of the granular details and some of the things are better left to Q&A. So please be ready with your questions and please feel free to use the Q&A function. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, so just again a reminder to everyone, we are looking at the College of Humanities and Sciences. This is an undergraduate student experience that's been created collaboratively by the two largest faculties in NUS, and that's the Faculty of Astronomy Sciences and the Faculty of Science. And as Dean uh, uh, Sun Sun mentioned just now, we are basically the oldest, some of the oldest, uh, some of the oldest uh, faculties on campus and some of the largest as well, right? And we collaborate to create this unified experience for all the students who want to do either an arts or a science uh, uh, degree. Thanks. And in the background, as uh, both uh, <clears throat> uh, Dean, uh, we and Dean uh, Sun mentioned just now, we are facing a more uncertain world. We want to really prepare our students for the world that we live in, right? And this is something that uh, we noticed for some time already. We used to say that, you know, we're preparing the students for the world of the future, but in fact, the future has already arrived already. And secondly, even the employers we talk to, and we talk to employers all the time, right? They keep telling us for a long time that, our graduates are very knowledgeable. They are skillful. They know how to do things. Um, they know how to get things done. But sometimes uh, they, they come to us and say that, hey, you know, can you make them more able to think broadly, make connections, you know, have a higher degree of empathy? Uh, they are not complaining about students per se, but they are saying that you know, these are the kinds of things that we really need in our uh, employees and uh, associates going forward. So we take that very, very seriously. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I don't have, yeah, and you see, so the mission and which uh, uh, 
vision of the CHS, that means College of Humanities and Sciences, is as follows. As uh, Prof. has already mentioned, we really want you to be prepared for the future worlds ahead. So I guess everybody understand that uh, it's uh, very interesting that the future world is really complex. And we really want our students to be able to adapt to many, many different changes. So how do we prepare you for that? So naturally, the strong foundation in your disciplines that will be very important. And not only the other skill sets like writing, critical thinking, and even uh, digital knowledge and uh, competency in those things, and very importantly, your learning capacity is strongly, strongly emphasized because you're just going to be with us for four years. But after that, you need to continue to continue to upgrade, improve yourself. So we'll teach you ways to learn on your own. Okay. So going into the breadth of the system, okay, uh, you understand uh, I can try to approach solutions to a problem by taking advantage of the knowledge and the strength of different disciplines and put them together. And you come up with the most ideal solution that says. So you can see that uh, part of our uh, curriculum is this interdisciplinary nature. So we really want you to think very broad and you can synthesize and integrate knowledge from different domains. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chong Hao. Yeah, but just a bit of a... Um, uh, you know, little information about how the whole thing works because I think there are, there's often a lot of misunderstanding. So yes, if you are coming to the College of Humanities and Sciences, you are essentially pursuing a degree in humanities or social science or natural and mathematical sciences. For instance, you're pursuing a degree in uh, physics with a prof uh, some of there, or perhaps in philosophy or history or psychology or life sciences, marine biology, and, and so on and so forth, right? So if you are even thinking of one of these degrees, or causes in humanities, social science, or the natural and mathematical sciences, then you are basically applying to the College of Humanities and Sciences in NUS, right? And we welcome you. But of course, uh, we don't offer degrees in engineering, we don't offer degrees in business, computer science, and so forth. Those are other degree granting faculties in the rest of the university. Now, don't confuse us with also the various kinds of you know, enhancements and add ons and special programs that currently exist in NUS. And they have existed, some of them have existed for a long time as well. So for the biggest, of course, is the NUS uh, Honors College, NUS College, right? But there are also NUS, NUS overseas colleges, uh, which, is, uh, which is more about enterprise and the various residential colleges and a special program in science as well. So don't confuse us with that. Now, as an enhancement and add-on, you can do those things while pursuing one of those degrees on the left, right? But if you are pursuing a degree, you, you, you got to belong to one of those things on the left. CHS, CDE, business, and so on and so forth. And then you can add on uh, to that with one of the enhancements. So this is just a conceptual point to make sure that people uh, don't confuse us. So we, some, we often get questions, uh, how does it compare, how does CHS compare with NUS college? You know, what about NUS uh, overseas college? No, these are not on the same plane at all, right? You can't be an NUS college student or NUS overseas college student unless you are already in, unless you're also an NUS student, which means that you're pursuing a degree in one of the things on the left, okay? Thank you. So now let me explain the curriculum structures in more details. Now, typically the students come into university uh, uh, on the average per semester, they'll take five modules. So two semester, that means 10 modules per year, four years program, so you have 40 modules. Yeah. So this is the minimum basics that you need to fulfill in terms of a requirement. That's why the degree requirement is stated there, 40 modules. Typically one module has four MC, so we call it uh, 160 modular credits. Now let's imagine I divide these 40 modules into a pie chart as shown on the picture on the right there. Yeah. So roughly speaking, we divide it into about one third, one third, one third. In fact, uh, 13 modules for this blue part, 15 modules for the orange part, and then 12 modules for the gray part. The blue part is what we call common curriculum, 13 modules, uh, which we, will, we understand that every student must go through this training is compulsory for everybody, okay, that we uh, aim to teach you different skill set like writing, digital skill, but concepts like Asian studies, humanity subjects, scientific inquiry, and interdisciplinary. So later we explain this in more detail. And then the orange part is your major. Okay, in other words, let's say you choose to become a major in a certain discipline, then the department will design 15 modules that you can take, that you should take. Uh, I say so these 15 modules can be a combination of a compulsory one plus a basket or module which you choose from elective one. Okay. Then the gray part is what we call unrestricted elective, 12 module desk. Uh, that gray part is very, very flexible. Uh, so we leave it to the students to design what you want to do with the gray color part. Okay. So to graduate with a certain major, okay, all you need is a 15 modules. Okay. So 
that great part allows you a lot of flexibility. This is the merit, the, the good things about this particular curriculum structures. You can choose to spend 10 modules from the great part, the 12 modules into a second major. For example, maybe you're interested in life science. So you choose uh, to do life science. You have 15 modules from the life science program. And then maybe you want to do psychology as well. Okay, so then you can take 10 modules from the uh, psychology program. Yeah, that allows you to have a second major. Uh, so, so you graduate with a um, primary major and a secondary major. Now, some students may not want to do uh, uh, all the 10 modules on the se secondary major. You can do a minor, okay, which only contribute by five modules. Uh, so the structures is very interesting. It allows you to do a lot of combinations of a double major, okay. Now, some students may uh, want to push themselves a bit more, okay? You see, because one major is contributed by 15 modules, let's say now I have a uh, 12 module in the unrestricted elective, maybe I do three more, okay? So I can spend the entire 15 modules onto a second major. Now, depending on the major you choose, if it's from two different faculties, then you may, uh, two different faculty or two different degree program, you may be able to graduate with double degree. Uh, so this is a very attractive part about this, curriculum structures, and we leave it to the student to design what you want to do. Okay. Next slide, yeah. Uh, so here it is. Let me expand a little bit on the blue color part, which is a common curriculum. 13 modules for every single CHS students must go through. So see, we have a different basket. Six, bus six common modules on writing, community and engagement, design thinking, artificial intelligence, data literacy, and digital literacy. You see the names of the module, it really, train you all to be prepared for the very, very you know, complex future world that you need to be able to, uh, the skill set you need to be able to uh, adapt, uh, develop so that you can adapt to any uh, changes that comes your way. Okay? And then we have integrated module, you see the titles, we have integrated Asian studies, humanities, social sciences, and scientific inquiry one and two. So in other words, we train you to be a, a somewhat of an all-rounded person to be able to think from the perspective of different disciplines. Yeah. And then two, interdisciplinary modules, uh, which is very exciting. The professor have a lot of fun designing the modules uh, whereby we'll have certain guiding topic and that guiding topics will have a perspective of different discipline. Uh, then students will be able to realize, aha, once I learn all this thing, my solutions to a problem will be much more comprehensive. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah I wanna, let me say something about, let me say a little bit more about the common curriculum. Mm. These things, depending on what degree structure, what degrees you're pursuing, let's say you're pursuing physics, right? You may think to yourself, why do I need design thinking? Why do I need the, the writing module, right? Uh, you know, why do I need Asian studies? Now, these modules exist not just to prepare you for the rest of your short little time in NUS. It's a very short time. These things exist so that you can be an effective citizen out there in the world, right? They lay the foundation for you to learn other things. Even if you are a science major, you will not be able to escape dealing with people, dealing with words, critical thinking with words in the future, especially once you're past very entry-level jobs. Even if you are a literature major, you will not escape facing a world in which AI is rampant. You will not escape a world in which you may need to design something, you may need to use digital platforms and digital, be able to think in a digital way. So right, all these modules exist to prepare you for their world. They are not just for your time in NUS. Right? So this is something that I think uh, you need to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. A, thanks. Additional knowledge may even yeah. inspire you to have a new ideas uh, in your own discipline. That's, that's what I find very interesting, yeah. yeah. So the next slide, yeah. yeah. Um, so just, just to, this is just a you know, cover to say that, yeah, let's talk about you know, how you want to, you know, what are the majors you can choose from and the different ways to use your unrestricted electives and post how has really started talking about them already. There are many majors to choose from. Thanks. Yeah, next one. Right. So all of the traditional humanities and social science and uh, Asian studies and, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, science and mathematical science, uh, uh, you know, majors are available here. This, this is pretty much the widest and most comprehensive offering you're going to find in Singapore in one under one, one, one structure. Okay. Uh, the new one there, some of you may have noticed already, is anthropology, only recently added. Very exciting, right? The three at the bottom, they are, they are the cross disciplinary programs uh, that uh, Prof. Uh, Yen and uh, Prof. Uh, mentioned just now as well. So the ones that has the asterisks, and only a few of them, a handful of them, these are direct admissions courses that require, that you know, typically require you to either apply at a point of entrance, or even if you want to come in after the first year, we tend to have special entry requirements. Okay, thanks. 
So, so uh, you notice that we do not list down the combinations of primary major and secondary major because you think about the mathematics, right? Uh, we have so many primary major and then the others also can be considered as a major on its own. So if you imagine what is the, the combinations of choosing two from this basket of uh, 30 and 30, so, you know, it's totally like, and it's impossible to list, yeah. So we will allow the student to uh, realize that you really have the freedom to have many different combinations of the choice of your major, primary major and secondary major, uh, or even if you just want a primary major, that's fine also. So here, over here, we list out some example because from experience, we know that these are quite common uh, students, it's popular among the students. For example, I mentioned already, life sciences and psychology, this is a uh, uh, common uh, combinations. Uh, then we have a uh, physics and philosophy. In fact, um, on Saturday, when, during our physical open house, we invite a student who is majoring in physics and uh, doing a second major in philosophy, they kind of share with you. Uh, so, and then you can even consider uh, chemistry, forensic science, and Japanese studies, right? Chinese studies and quantitative finance. So truly, okay, so there's a lot of uh, a wide variety of different combinations for the students to consider. And then when you graduate and then you present your CV to your employ potential employer, the employer say, ah, this person is very knowledgeable in mathematics and also very good in economics. Okay, don't you want to hire such a person because you have like, like two in one kind of combinations? Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, now let me explain the curriculum structures a bit more in detail, okay? Uh, you no longer see a pie chart, you see bar chart now, but you have the color coding is the same, yeah? So now we turn the pie chart into a bar chart. You see now we have the blue part, which is a common curriculum, the orange part, which is your major, and the gray part, which is the unrestricted elective. So can you imagine what type of, what kind of students do we have in CHS? Uh, let me start from the bottom. Let's say now uh, we have a student who is very, very deeply interested in a certain topic. Okay, let me use physics as an example since I'm a physics prof, okay? So let's say a student who is in, very interested in physics. Yeah, so obviously the student need to do the 15 modules major in physics. But the student can choose to spend the entire 12 modules on the unrestricted elective in physics as well. Can you see that now there's no gray color, everything is orange color. Uh, but the students still have to do the 13 modules of common curriculum. So you see at the bottom bar chart, shape, it's a blue color bar plus the orange color bar. Now this group of students, now uh, we call them the deep specialists because they really, really want to focus very passionate about a single discipline. They want to go very, very deep in this. Then a second group of students, or we call them the integrator. Uh, so this group of students will do the common curriculum, the blue color part. And then of course, the primary major, the orange color part. And then in their 12 modules of the unrestricted elective, they say, ah, okay, uh, I want to prepare myself to have a second major, okay? So the student choose uh, primary major in X, secondary major in Y, okay? So in combinations, the students have a good balance uh, training in two different disciplines. Yeah. So two different uh, major. In this particular case, uh, we term the students the integrator, okay? So uh, they can draw connections between two disciplines and then a reasonably in-depth knowledge in both. Yeah. Then the third group of students, uh, we call them the versatilists. Okay? So the students who do the blue color part, which is common curriculum, and then orange color part, the major, primary major. Uh, in the unrestricted elective, the students say, okay, I want to learn certain knowledge in X, certain knowledge in Y, certain knowledge in Z. This is also possible because it's entirely up to you for you to design. Yeah. So maybe secondary major 10 modules is too much. Uh, you may consider a minor, which only is contributed by five modules. You have 12 to use, so you can even do two minor. Do you think about it? Yeah. So you see that. So these are the versatiles. Yeah. And I want you to also pay attention in the sense that, look, the size of the bar charts is the same in that sense. So in other words, irregardless of whether you are deep specialist, integrator, versatilist, to graduate with a degree, okay, the number of modules that you need to take is the same for all three categories of students. Uh, so it's your choice of what you want to do and how you want to decide your education journey. And I want to emphasize that you don't have to decide this on the first day of school. No, uh, we invite you to come into CHS, read different modules, uh, sit into different uh, classes, and then try to sample and see which one is your uh, really your true uh, passion. Then you really like the subject. You never know that maybe you have not learned this in JC or uh, in poly before, okay? but now you pick up this new knowledge that really stimulate you to think deeper and further. Next slide. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to, uh, we won't spend as much time on all these uh, different other things here because there are other talks throughout the day uh, where we talk about this. Uh, later on, in fact, I'm giving a talk together with another uh, vice dean from science about the expansion learning opportunities in NUS, right? So, you know, there are all these different enriching opportunities uh, throughout NUS. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
And of course, uh, we do have study abroad programs as well. And the thinking here is quite important to get it right. We, we want our students to have an OC experience, not because we believe that you can learn something in a classroom on that side that somehow we can't teach. It's usually not so straightforward. Usually whatever they can teach in a classroom, we can teach in a classroom too. But there are certain things that you, can, you can't learn in a classroom, right? You don't get to learn to, you know, to, you, you, you don't get to say that I have experienced what it means to travel overseas, live there for four months of my own, do my own laundry, you know, other food in a different language. That's not the kind of stuff we can teach you in a classroom, right? It's something that you have to do, right? And even, even for the people who don't go somewhere, the students who went on exchange means that someone else is coming in from somewhere else. That means that our students get to interact with international students too. And this is a very important part of the learning process because the learning that takes place in university and the value of your experience here, the value of your education here is not just in your classroom. It's also about the experiences that you have and the friends and the networks that you, you form. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, uh, we do have a you know, fully worked out uh, career preparation program where we put students through pay their paces throughout all four years. There are things to do throughout all four years, actually, and we will lay them down for you in a modular structure. So these are, you know, where we slowly scaffold you, you know, you, perhaps you just start by, you know, crafting your CV, you know, uh, go to different workshops where we teach you how to, you know, craft your CV properly and go for interviews and all that. And, you know, by the end of first or second year, you are looking for internships and trying out different mentorship programs and so on and so forth, right? Thank you. So uh, then uh, once you graduate, uh, the next point is, okay, what do I do? What is my career pathway, okay? Yeah, so of course the uh, CHS is now in the second years. We don't ha really have any graduate yet, but uh, we do have a lot of students in both in FSS and FOS uh, that we track their career uh, development. And then a number of students also already uh, doing some kind of a double major kind of combinations already, yeah. But just look at the list, yeah, okay? So we do have a lot of uh, career pathway in the so-called, you think uh, if you learn this, you do this as a career. For example, like maybe uh, food science and technologies, you can become a food technologist. Uh, but we also have uh, a lot of students who may be learning in certain discipline, but it is their problem solving skills that is attractive to the employer. Okay? So they become, uh, they take up jobs, they take up careers, whereby it really take advantage of their, their ability to solve problems, their critical thinking skills, analyze the situations, come up with solutions. If you think about it, this is really the training you will have in the CHS. So here is a, this is a really, really long list of uh, our alumni who has gone through and uh, excel in their different career sector. Okay? So if you look at it, this is a really wide range, in, uh, ranging from the policies, management, uh, uh, science, research, environmental consultants, so on and so forth. I mean, it's too long for a list for us to, to list down, uh, but you can see that uh, it's a very, very wide uh, spectrum of a career that you can explore. Uh, and then good thing is, uh, like Paul Floyd had mentioned, we actually arrange a lot of career preparations um, event for you, uh, in which we invite also a potential employer to come and talk to you, and then you get to be able to interact with them and then showcase your talent. And then if you're interested, you can even consider internship, right, to go and work with them beforehand. Yeah. Next slide, yeah. So uh, in summary, because we want to save more, more time for Q&A, yeah. So very importantly, uh, CHS is a four years honors degree journey, right? Uh, I want to emphasize again, it is a student-centric flexible journey. So you must take charge of your education journey. So in other words, you make decisions and then you make choices on what you want to do for your major and whether you want to become a deep specialist, integrator or versatilist, okay? Very distinct common curriculum, the blue color part the common curriculum, uh, we have so much fun developing it and learning uh, to, uh, to introduce very, very exciting modules for the students so that they get to see and think in a way that allows them to become a, a broad citizens of the world. In that sense, interdisciplinary natures of the module is the important aspect which definitely we emphasize. Okay. So all these trainings, what do we hope to do? We hope that you uh, become very competitive when you go out to uh, search for a job, okay, apply for a job, market relevance. Okay. And then not only that, okay, we also want to make sure that you can continue to excel and to be competitive in terms of your career prospect, career growth, enhance your career prospect. Because uh, with the training, you have become a very adaptable and very flexible, able to solve different problems, even though the nature of the challenge may be new to you. Uh, and then we prepare you with various new skills for the digital world. Okay? And importantly, uh, you just not stay with us for four years. Uh, even after graduation, we also have a lot of uh, lifelong learning opportunity that is on offer uh, for our students to come back to learn even more. Okay, uh, next slide. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So I think that wraps up the presentations from us. So we really want to uh, use the time uh, to have uh, to address the Q&A. So maybe I... Yeah. Uh, Let's have uh, Melvin and uh, Fukim and all the rest, some of the other vice deans who are here, to come on uh, to show your faces. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, and Sushin as well, that's right. Yeah. Is Joseph here as well? I can't remember whether uh, Melvin is Joseph was with us. Also. I saw Joseph just yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, so we'll yeah. let's take some questions. So I don't mind. Uh, I can help coordinate a little bit. So uh, maybe one, okay, yeah. yeah, one quick one. Uh, because it's uh, FASS. Maybe Melvin can quickly answer. Uh, FASS is uh, you know we have a strange tradition of having our four thousand level modules coded at five modular credits. But of course, under CHS, they're all going to be recoded as four modular credits. Does it actually make a difference to the workload and all that? Melvin, you want to quickly just very quickly answer that. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, you're actually correct. Um, so there are plans to um, reduce the uh, number of modular credits for 4,000 level modules from five to four MCs. Um, this is uh, something that is still in the process of transition. Uh, and we will provide more uh, details to students uh, once the um, arrangement has been fully finalized. So look out for that. Uh, most likely the announcement will come out either sometime in the middle of um, the coming semester or the semester after. Um, but you can be assured that you will have all the information that you need uh, before you start taking 4,000 level modules. I, I just see Kalun also. <laughs> Sorry, I, I may see this now. <laughs> and good, and Joseph is here also. Yeah. Um, so there is a good question about, you know, I study a lot of science, you know, uh, you know in, in pre-university. So, you know, you know, do I, am I going to learn anything new in scientific? I want to generalize this. It could be, I study a lot of literature, why do I need, uh, you know, the humanities module? I study a lot, of, I don't know, I've done the China program, why do I need Asian studies? Uh, can I invite, you know, I know for you are, you are, you know, you are also part of this. Who else? Is anyone teaching SI1 and 2? You, some of you guys are. You want to say something about that? Yeah. Paul himself is teaching part of the SI1. Maybe I'll let him start first. With yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I think scientific inquiry one is that yeah. the way we approach is that it's designed to benefit all students, not just, the, the, you know, certain aspect of students. Now, uh, even if you have a science background, okay, but scientific inquiry one comes from the angles of uh, uh, what should you believe uh, uh, in terms of the scientific concept? Because do you see the evidence that uh, lend itself to the uh, deductions? Okay, so we design the experience in such a way that the student will go through a lot of of uh, uh, experiential learning, uh, online learning, and hands-on learning. Uh. So the component, the modules, uh, in fact, uh, comprises of a uh, field trip, comprises of lab, comprises of uh, in-class discussions, comprises of uh, online video. Yeah. In fact, this coming Saturday, uh, the in-person uh, open house uh, in the Faculty of Science, we have arranged for Professor Ryan Patton, who is a lecturer for SI1, to give you a mock lecture, to tell you a mock uh, discussions about what Scientific One is all about. Yeah. Let me, yeah, let me add to that, actually. And uh, the question is really about, you know, I come from a science background. Do I need to do scientific inquiry all over again? Well, actually, uh, I'm a pure science person and I wish, I wish when I was going through university, I had such a module. Because this scientific inquiry, one, one of the components, if you listen closely to what Chong Hao just mentioned just now, was about trying to debunk falsehood, trying to identify and separate between what is real uh, foundation for truth and what is that, uh, that is people just making claims and how do you even test them? Science is not about just uh, remembering a lot of facts. There's a lot of things that you must uh, uh, tease out whether this is the truth or not, where there are evidence that will hold water or not and so forth. This module, a very big proportion of this module will throw you into that kind of a situation. And it therefore means that it doesn't matter whether you had the scientific background or not, or you will come from a very humanities or arts type of a background. These are very vital skill sets and something that you will have to do uh, in the future because now you got all kinds of things going in social media and fake news and everything, right? You need to tell the difference between this and make good judgment. Yeah. A lot of this is based on, uh, 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 scientific inquiry one is based on that. And then you build upon, you build upon this in scientific inquiry two. Yeah, a very similar thing will be said for all of the integrated modules. In fact, all the common curriculum modules. Trust me, you are now at the university level. We don't really, if there's a sense, I'll say it not so nicely. We don't really care what you are studying in pre -O. It lays an important foundation, but now you are now, well, with the, you know, you are now at university level, but even the same subject, 
you may think that you have done a lot of it already, but actually you've only just started. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? You are, now you're, no, you're not just a science student anymore. You are in a sense in the company of scientists and learning, right? What does it mean to be, well, no, how to be a citizen scientist, even if you are not going to major in science and vice versa for all of the other community curriculum subjects as well. Uh, can we review, uh, we think, Man Chong Hao, we had done the study, right? How the different streams of students did academic, you know, in terms of the school. Go ahead, tell them. There's tell no, them. There's no, 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 yeah, go ahead, yeah. No. There's no difference. <laughs> no special advantage. Oh. Yeah. yeah. You, can you imagine if I teach a humanities one and the science students are doing just as well statistically mm. right, as the our students? That means that we design it to make sure all of you will benefit and all of you will be equally challenged. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> you don't get a free pass just because you've done a lot of X, whatever, wherever you come from. Okay, let's do another one. Is there a quota on the number of different majors and or uh, double majors, minors, whatever double degrees? Uh, you know, uh, Futhi, you want to start first, and Melvin and yeah. Joseph. Yeah. So, in principle, uh, whenever you see what we call an open major or open minor, there is no quota within CHS. However, uh, you saw the slides that uh, Loy and uh, Prof. So showed that there are some that has got that little asterisk there. Mm -hmm. Well, those with little asterisk, for example, the food science, for example, the pharmaceutical science, and a few others uh, in the minor uh, offerings as well, there, over there, there will be some quota because of uh, uh, resources labs and also because of the way we had to run those uh, major, uh, uh, majors and minor classes. Yeah, Anything else? No asterisk? you're free to take them, no quota. Now, uh, in, in relation to that, I, I, I'll let Melvin answer that, but I want to uh, say in relation to what about uh, majors or, or you want to do a second degree outside? We'll, uh, we'll come to that because there is a question like that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Melvin? Yeah, I uh, just want to reinforce the point that uh, my colleague Fuktim has already uh, made. Um, so even in FASS, we have no uh, restricted majors. Every major is open, meaning that there's no quota. If you're interested in doing any major, uh, we guarantee that you'll be able to access it. Uh, and, and for those of you who may not be aware, in the past, we used to have certain restrictions imposed on psychology. Uh, for example, you have to clear two uh, gateway mod two, uh, modules before we allow you to uh, major in psychology. Uh, that requirement is no longer in place. So, so those of you who have some, any interest in doing psychology, uh, but guarantee you access as long as you can uh, come in and pass the introductory module. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the exceptions, of course, are the ones that, uh, you know, as Putin mentioned, the ones with the asterisk. So, uh, so there are, I'm sorry, Melvin, there are some, there is at least one on FASS and that's PPE. Uh, don't forget yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. so, but, but it's not a quota system. We, we yeah. go by quality. If you meet a certain quality level, we'll take you. Okay. Um, timetable bidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to answer this? Joseph, uh, Kalun? Anyone? Maybe I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I, I think the concern here is about um, timetabling and yeah, yeah. fitting the classes into, into a nice looking timetable for you so that you have time uh, to do your own stuff, right? So, um, for most of the, the modules, it works this way, which is you first secure the module. So, you have to secure the, the, the lecture um, for that module. And the lectures usually has a, has a time slots like um, every Tuesdays and Fridays, two to four, that kind of stuff. So once you have managed to fit in the modules that you are going to read in the semester, then the timetabling for the tutorials or the seminars or the labs would come just after that. So it's about a week after that, when you have more or less uh, finalized the modules that you're reading, then you go into the tutorial uh, ranking or the tutorial allocation exercise. And that tutorial allocation exercise, it's based on ranking preferences. So there's actually a system that NUS students use where they will, for the modules that they have already been allocated for lectures, uh, they will go in to rank the kind of tutorial groups in terms of the preference for their time, the days and the times uh, in the system. And then the system will automatically uh, assign you to the highest available uh, slot there is. So if that particular time slot, there, there are 30 slots and there are 50 students who want that as their first choice, then of course they will be randomized. But if there is fewer, there are fewer than uh, 30 people who want that, then everybody gets that choice. So it's not on a first come first serve basis as, as rightfully pointed out by one of the, 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 the students or the questions that was posed. 
um, but it's also not done in such a way that it's um, entirely randomized. There is a ranking that you have to do to see if you do get your first choice eventually. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question. But the, the short version is, don't worry, lah, we'll look after you. <laughs> okay, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, there's a there's a very good question about common curriculum, and I want to go back to it. Um, will you say that CHS students are less able to specialize in their degrees, especially if they intend to take a major? How will CHS ensure that CHS students do not lose out in terms of employment? Now, here's the funny thing, right? We talk to employers all the time for a very long time. None of them, at least in our own, uh, you know, for FASS and FOS, they, they don't complain to us that our students are not specialized in our one. Right? If they want to complain, it's like, hey, you know, the guy didn't interview very well. It's something like that. Okay. The truth of the matter is, seriously, whatever you learn with us, it needs to lay a very good foundation. But you have to do the rest of the learning, whatever you go. When they hire you, it's because they think that you can do the rest of the learning. Hmm. You realize that? Okay. If, if you have 17 modules, you will not automatically look better than someone with only 15 modules. Because when you go for interview, those two modules are not going to make any difference. People are going to see whether you can actually do something with your knowledge. They're going to see whether you can actually present yourself. They're going to see whether you can actually work in teams. So if your concern is employment, my advice to you is, you make sure that you definitely do your major well, you know, learn what you need to learn there, learn, you know, the foundations and the basics and, you know, go deep as, as needed. But you make sure you pick up the rest of your career preparation skills because those things are going to be the real difference makers. Okay, so that's my general piece of advice. But, okay, go back to the more straightforward answer. The answer is no, right? Because remember the three different parts of the curriculum that the Prof. Sao mentioned just now, common curriculum, UE, uh, unrestricted electives and major, you can fill your entire unrestricted electives with your first major if you really want to be that kind of a specialist. You say, you know, Prof. Loy, my ambition is to go knock some atoms in CERN. I want to do physics, like everything, you know. Yes, you can do even more physics modules than your predecessors who are not from CHS. You realize that? You can do 27 modules in physics if that's what you really, really want. My advice to you will be, Think about that carefully. Is that the kind of person you want to be? If it is, then you do that. But if you're not targeting to be an atom smasher in CERN, you're doing something else, then learning a few other things may not be a crazy thing, right? So you say, no, maybe I'll work in the bank. Then maybe you want to take some modules in finance. You want to take some modules in econs. You want to maybe learn Japanese or whatever it is. Learn some other languages. So, so think a bit more strategically don't only think that it's just about the subject that subject of study right John, how you want to add to that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so just add on to that uh, uh, on the earlier point the employer employer come to me say, uh, can you give me a person who have very very interesting idea when he go about trying to solve problem in their research project for example because truly the topic of uh, specializations that uh, they don't really worry because if they really want to learn they will just send you for additional courses to pick up that very specific topic but they really want problem solver they want to have, uh, they want to see that you are able to learn on your own and in fact, uh, learn from the solutions to prior problem and then try it out and if it doesn't work, tweak it a little bit and then adapt it and then come up with a better solution to a problem. And that's what the employer wants. Yeah. So having broader discipline, having a specialized discipline is one of the way to build your foundations, build your breath and depth. Okay. But when you really confront, uh, when the employer see you, right, they will look at you to see whether this one can help me to push my company forward. Uh, so this is the idea, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, um, Lloyd, there is one thing I want to say here is that who says we need, you only need to do 40 uh, or you can only yeah. do 40 yeah. modules, yeah. 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 This is the mindset that we always think, you know, and because I think we are so used to just being given a template, okay, do this and follow this. In CHS and US, if you really want to do more, you can. In other words, you can graduate. The minimum is 40 within a particular structure. But if you really want to do 43 modules, you can. And we won't charge you an additional cent extra for the fees. Mm -hmm. You want to take six, seven modules after your first semester, you can. Of course, we will advise you. You all have mentors and we will advise you. And if you're doing well, we say, go ahead, boy. Go ahead. You, you looks like you, you're really interested. But... We, the mentor will also be there because he's seen other students and say that, you know, maybe you, are, you need to pace yourself. 
maybe just continue to do five for the time being. So the decision is really yours. Yeah. Mm. So don't restrict yourself this way. Yeah. Let me follow up on a question from Kylie. Yeah, if I decide to take up a second major after year one, does it mean that I have to graduate later because I need to clear more modules? Answer is no. Yeah, because remember the unrestricted elective is whereby we ask you to use that space to explore and try it out. Yeah, so you can use that particular space and then try out uh, modules that you think you might be interested in the second major in. Yeah, uh, then you then after that this is typically the gateway module. Then after that you realize ah this is really what I want, and then you can continue to take the modules related to that second major, which is the the remaining nine. Yeah, so uh, we have designed the curriculum in such a way that you're not going to be delayed. Yeah, so you can complete everything uh, within the four years. Yeah, and in fact, uh, you know, depending on your plan, like what Prof Chu say, right? Yeah, some uh, typically we encourage a student to consider five modules. Okay, uh, but uh, maybe after one, two semester, you got the hang of it, right? You find, okay, I can manage the time and energy. Uh, maybe I do six in one more uh, semester. So it depends on your planning. We have a lot of uh, mentors who will guide you to give you suggestions about what you can do with your academic journey. Yeah, yeah. remember that as a Prof, you mentioned we charge by the semester. We don't charge by the module. If we charge by the module, we'll be a lot richer. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but again, advice is you know we I done the data study before. I know that a lot of students graduate with many more than forty modules. Yeah. But sometimes I also worry a bit because I think don't just think of modules and you know learning in the classroom. Don't forget the rest of your learning. You're not squeezing all the value of a university education if all you can think of is the classroom and the courses. Okay. You're not making friends. You're not, you know, sometimes a student will come to me and say, Prof, I'm doing, you know, eight modules. I'm learning this. I'm, I'm an econ student. I'm also learning coding. And I say, are you sleeping? Are you drinking enough water? <laughs> <laughs> are you making any friends at all? That, that would be my question to him, him or her, right? And these are very important things because you don't get the most value out of your university education if the only thing you know how to think of is modules, modules, modules. Yeah. The modules are important. We are proud of them, but they are not, not the only thing we offer in any lesson. Melvin, you want to say something? I want like to say something about that too. Uh, we do have special term modules. Um, yeah. So that's one avenue for you to explore if you want to take uh, extra modules, but you're hesitant about overloading within the regular semesters. And as um, Prof. Lai mentioned, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we see more and more students doing is to go on internships. And, and the nice thing about CHS is that you can go on internships and get modular credits for doing these internships. Uh, and I, th I think there was a question uh, that I saw just now about whether how internship modules are graded. Is it, will you, will you get a letter grade for this internship modules or will it be more on a past fail kind of basis? Or uh, maybe I, we could have Sushin and, and Lloyd say something about that. Uh, yeah. Sushin, you say something about how, how do science students apply for internships? They should be quite yeah. similar. So, so this yeah. applies to another question about how you apply for internships. There are a lot of different routes to get uh, internships. Uh, you know, you can self-source certain internships or you can go to this platform called Talent Connect that NUS have where a lot of companies post internships on. So uh, I think this connects back to uh, Prof. Lloyd's uh, comment, right? You don't just want to think about modules. You want to think about experiential learning, your, uh, whether you participate in CCAs, you go for internships and think of things like that. At the same time, I would say that we also have all CHS students be enrolled in this thing called the Career Compass modules, where you will be started on career preparation from the very first day of your uh, journey with us. So that helps you think about how to uh, shape out your uh, academic uh, you know, training so that you can then get into employment that you want in the future. Okay, so think about all of these things together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so our um, there's something that, uh, you know, we're, we're very mindful also. We don't actually want to make things so easy for you that you just walk into it because part of the learning process is to apply and, you know, get rejected and apply and, you know, and that's actually part of the learning process, right? Uh, people like uh, Shushing, myself and others, a lot of the times we meet stakeholders to persuade them to open up internships and persuade them to open up and advertise with our students, right? So our job is we try to get as many of these opportunities as possible, right? We talk to we, you know, stakeholders all the time for that, but then we need you to apply and we need you to go through the process because you learn that way, okay? Uh, but, re but rest assured that the opportunities totally exist, uh, you know, and we work very hard to make sure they do, yeah. Um, uh, there was okay. a 
there's a bunch of questions about the XDPs, maybe uh, DSE and all that. Maybe you all can answer uh, our science colleagues. You know. I think Julie is the typing answer right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, maybe at this point I bring up another mm. uh, important information now. So uh, we didn't bring this up earlier on because it will be very confusing for you. But uh, I think now with uh, a slight understanding of the uh, a certain understanding of the CHA structure, let me bring up another point. Let's say now uh, I'm interested in chemistry. So I do a major in chemistry. Then I think, okay. Maybe I want to do a secondary major in material science and engineering. Uh, wait a second. Material science and engineering is not CHS. It's from the College of Design and Engineering. So can I do that? Answer is yes. yes. Ah, so you see how complex and how flexible it is. So we may have students who want to pursue a major in chemistry and a second major in material science and engineering, which is offered by College of Design and Engineering, not CHS. The answer is yes, so you can do that. Uh, so can you imagine, so you'll be able to become very specialist in chemistry and then the fundamental knowledge, and then you can take advantage of your knowledge to go into material science, which tend to be uh, is engineering, right? So a bit more applied in that sense, yeah. So you can expand your horizon in terms of what you want to combine. So the other colleges, the programs there, okay, uh, many of which also can be factored into your considerations for your second major. Uh, how about second degree? Yes, also. Yeah. So maybe I want to add, if you are thinking of a second degree in any of the engineering, uh, like Prof. Uh, so said, you can, but engineering will require you to take a second degree. Yeah? Uh, and to do a second degree in engineering, then you will be wondering, hey, in CHS, there's a common curriculum. In CDE, also got common curriculum, then how? Must do two common curriculum? Ah? No, we have already made the plans okay. where the yeah. two common curriculums, some of them will overlap. Mm -hmm. There will be some, and we have it even in our CHS website that if you're thinking of a double degree between a CHS major and an engineering major, you will have to take certain modules from their common curriculum and certain common curriculums from our CHS uh, pool basically. The details is already in the website, but you can then come and ask us if you are not very clear. So the point is, it is possible, yeah. right? And this also applies to sometimes uh, um, uh, 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 BIS school or uh, a school of computing. But you must also understand with uh, BIS school, school of computing, there is a certain number that we have. Uh, but the thing is, at the moment, uh, we've run CHS for the first cohort already. Eh? We haven't burst the quota. So mm. if you are really thinking about it, come and consider them all as well. Yeah. Yeah. So how many years is required for one degree? Four years. How many uh, years is required for another degree? Four years. But now under this new design structure, how many years for two degree? Still four. <laughs> <laughs> Can be done in four. Can be done in four. Four but, to five. Uh, okay. Like, uh, four to five. Yeah. Four to yeah. five. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Depending on how how lucky you are, <laughs> how much sleep you want, and how many friends you want to make, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. What's the difference between the content in the data literacy modules and the various kind of stats and data modules, all the way to even political inquiry, which is a three thousand level module? Right. Okay. I'll give a short answer first, and I'll invite the rest to say something. Hmm. Sometimes you will see that there are overlapping con uh, or content, right? Um, but if we believe that the higher level module you done already meet the lower level requirement, uh, you can do that sometimes, right? So, so data literacy is actually a very good example, right? So instead of taking the, the lowest common tier, which is GA 1000 module, uh, which pretty much everyone is supposed to do, but if you're taking a high level module, actually you have already met that requirement. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind, right? So if you're the 76 module, for instance, you, you have met it. But even on top of that, the fact of the matter is that you don't just learn it once, right? You do have to reinforce it. You do have to reinforce it with more advanced concepts, more advanced applications, right? Different kinds of platforms. So don't worry about it. You know, they, they do relate to each other. So even if you're doing more than one statistics module, it's very unlikely that you are literally just learning the same thing over again, right? We're making you work harder and uh, making sure that you are reinforcing yourself. Uh, Melvin, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I mean, obviously I can't say uh, yeah. how exactly the... the I'm, so I'm, I'm from the psychology department. I can't say exactly how the research and statistical methods uh, modules overlap in terms of the stats content or, uh, with other modules such as um, the gateway module for statistics. 
But I can tell you that uh, at least within psychology, there's a very strong research component. Uh, so I teach actually PL2132. Uh, and in addition to learning stats, the students also have to learn how to design a psychology experiment, uh, yeah. collect data, analyze the data, and write it up uh, as, as though they were presenting at a conference or as though they were uh, publishing within a journal. Um, so th these are things that are not likely to be found in other stats related or other relate research related um, uh, modules. These are very specific to psychology. So mm. uh, as Prof. Lloyd said, there's likely to be overlap, but there are also things that you are going to pick up that are specific to your own disciplinary training. Yeah, same, same for political inquiry, right? PS uh, 3257. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are very similar kinds of things going on uh, in other majors, including science majors as well. Okay. Mm. Lloyd, there's a question on NUS College. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so if you are in NUS college and you are essentially pursuing a CHS degree, a CHS major, uh, then the majority of the CHS common curriculum will be replaced by NUS college modules. Uh, the precise details, unfortunately, I'm not at liberty to uh, say a lot right now because we are still waiting for the final approval meeting, which is, you know, well, in over a week's time. Uh, but I can say that uh, you know the vast majority of the CHS common curriculum modules you'll be reading as you'll be reading NUS college uh, modules instead. Uh, yeah. I hope that answers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um what are the what are SU modules and how does it work? I, I think there are a lot of people who don't really know how our SU system works, and they were surprised at you know how it works and how generous it is. Who wants to say who wants to tell them the good news? <laughs> Maybe I'll make Joseph say something about SU. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you muted? Yeah. So the uh, SU options allows you to uh, either kind of pass or non-pass for the module instead of receiving um, a letter grade, which kind of um, uh, uh, later contributes to your um, uh, cumulative uh, average points. So um, for example, I mean, if you decide you want to kind of explore module without uh, kind of potentially risking it your kind of cap score later on, then you might kind of use the SU option to, uh, to kind of explore it basically with a kind of peace of mind, so to speak, right? So uh, we're quite generous in kind of allowing uh, kind of a certain number of modules for you to use this. So this is uh, something you can kind of use as an option as you explore different kind of modules, right? Yeah, okay. So the part that a lot of them don't realize is that you only need to tell us whether you are going to SU the module after you receive your grade. That's how generous we are because not all universities do it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, so don't worry, do the module like proper. And then after that, you look at the mod, you look at the grade, you're, you know, you're like, ah, I Nah, this is not as good as I thought it could be. <laughs> you can SU it. That's fine. Yeah, right. and and Lloyd, the, the system is even more generous now. Now, now, uh, you you declare you do your SU declaration at the end of the academic year. So let's say you mess up some modules after your first semester, uh, and but and you can then decide at the end of the second semester. Look, I, I didn't do so well on those. I, I will take an SU grade for that for those modules instead. So the university is really uh trying to create a very forgiving environment, especially for students who are. Uh, not used to university requirements after national service. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I, I think, think, yeah, yeah, go sorry, ahead. Like, yeah, I, I think the, the SU uh, policy works really well with our CHS uh, kind of um, common curriculum in the first year, as well as, you know, the gateway modules that are open to every student. So because we, we, we have this uh, buffet of majors, right? And sometimes students come in not really clear on what is their interest, what is their strength and so on. So by experimenting various gateway modules across the various majors offered by the, the two faculties, uh, and then later on decide that, okay, so, so this is the major that I want to settle on eventually. And for the other ones that I have tried and perhaps I didn't do so well because maybe my strength is not really there, I can actually then apply the SU option on those uh, and those, grades that I got would not affect my CAP. So I, I think with the, with the kind of flexibility and the kind of options that we offer uh, across all the various majors through the gateway modules, the, the use of the SU options on these are very relevant and very, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I got a piece of advice and a piece uh, and a kind of a request or so, right? When you go into a module, go in with the right mindset, go in the module that 
you know, even though this may be unfamiliar to you, you know, I'm going to try your best. I'm going to try my best. And we'll see what happens after that. Imagine a system which is not so generous, like where we tell you to decide beforehand whether you want to ask you the module. Then there's going to be a bunch of science students with my module, which is humanities module, who got their A's and A pluses, who are going to be very, who are going to be like, hey, yeah, why did I do it? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Can, can you imagine that, right? So go into the module with the right mindset. Right? Because your classmates are kind of counting on you too, right? Because when you have good discussion, why do you want to be the person to drag people down? Right? Yeah. Don't you want to learn something out of this? And then you may discover that this is not what you thought it was. You are the science student, you are the humanities student who came into SI1 thinking that you know it's going to be really uh, boring or unfamiliar or whatever. And then you realize that this is really, really interesting. I'm still majoring in literature, but this really was interesting, right? So, so going to the modules with an open mind, you are now in the university. You are no longer on a conveyor belt where we just feel stuff and you do stuff for us and we give you gold stars. You are now in the university. You've got to take ownership of your learning, okay? including of unfamiliar things. Because otherwise, why bother to come to university at all? Right? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Lloyd, also a question about uh, the, the number of SU options that you have. Um, so mm -hmm. basically, in your first year, you're given 32 MCs, uh, which you can ask you. 32 MCs is basically eight modules. Uh, and you are allowed to carry over up to 12 MCs that you can use in your second, third, and fourth year. Um, so basically... Uh, you're not forced to use SU. So if you get A plus for every single module in your first year, obviously it doesn't make sense to SU anything. Uh, but but if you want, you can um use all the you can use all the A two or you can use twenty MCs and carry over twelve um to, to be used in, in later years. Um, so so the, the choice is yours. You have a lot of power to decide how you want to use your SU modules. However, you must remember your SU is only applicable to uh, mostly the level 1000 modules and selected level 2000 modules without uh, prerequisites, yeah? Yeah, yeah that's, right. That, that's right, yeah. yeah. I think none of us actually came from the SU era, right? Yeah. No, 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 yeah. Yeah, I just want to reinforce a point that Prof. Lloyd made. Um, don't use SUs uh, in an over-strategic manner. So don't, don't say, I'm going to SU this module. So I'm going to do the minimum possible work no. to just uh, scrape by with, with an S. I, I, I think that doesn't do yourself any service. You, you, you're only going to be in university uh, for four years in your life. Try to make the best use of your time here. Enjoy the modules. Participate in group work. Throw yourself into the into coursework. Yeah. So so mm. that's that's our advice to you. As, as you, none of the professors here had the benefit of a great list first year or SU options. I think we really enjoyed the courses that we take, not having this kind of safety net uh, beneath us. Yeah, yeah. I want to add on to that. Uh, this because we know that the future generations of students are you going to have a, a a lifetime of careers. So in other words, you'll be switching different to do different things. Yeah. So in other words, you'll be confronted with a choice to you have to switch to do a different thing whereby you have to pick up totally new knowledge. Uh. So we want you to be already, you know, um, have this kind of mentality. Uh. It's okay, even though I'm switching from what I know X and then I'm going to learn Y now, but uh, I know that uh, I have this experience of uh, choosing something that I'm less familiar with and I go about trying to go through the learning process. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what uh, do the... Mm. Yeah, Melvin? Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm just, I, just, I, I see a question here about a student who has been offered the XDP in Econs and Data yeah. Science and the student's a little concerned because this is a new uh, program. Um, so he or she is wondering whether he can get some assurance about whether this course will continue to continue running. Um, does anyone have any comments? Here to make Let me comment this? on this. The XDP with Econs and Data Science is super popular. Uh, and actually it's been getting a lot of uh, good attention uh, because um, firstly, it is one of those combinations that people sit up to. Most recently, when we have our board of trustee meeting, uh, just about two or three weeks ago, one of the CEOs who happened to be a member of the board just asked, hey, this is a very interesting combination and we should have more of this. How come you guys taking only so few people? We should have more people. But then we explained that actually those who take this, there are other options, right? And I think in the question, there are some people who say, I didn't apply for the XDP. Can I still do econs and data science? Yes, you can. You can do it through as a primary major in econs or primary major in data science, and then you take a second major uh, in, in uh, the alternative one. You don't have to be in the main one. The difference between the XDP is that the XDP program has been uh, curated such that at the end of the day, 
from the onset, they are already made uh, uh, to do the integration. Many of the, what we call the XDP modules, there are about a few of them, uh, they are purposefully integrating both data science and economics, yeah? And uh, so to assure the person who asked the question, it's new, yes, but it's been doing very well. All the students are very, very keen to do it. And there are more people like you who really want to come in. So no, I don't think anytime soon we will be hey, uh, doing anything with this and defuncting. If anything, I think we'll probably get a request more from the employers. Is there any difference in workload between you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 level of modules? You know, you know, how, why are they coded this way? Uh, you know, modular credits. I'll give a short version of the answer first, right? Modules that are worth four modular credits, according to NUS best practice, and this is actually on the website somewhere, right? Uh, equate, you know, roughly translates to about 10 hours of work per week. So when you're doing a four MC module, you are putting in about 10 hours of work, including contact time, including your own preparation, including going to labs, including your own group work, and so on and so forth. Right, okay, so that's point number one. Are level 1,000 level modules, in a sense, easier than uh, level 2, level 3, level 4? In one sense, it has to be, right? Because they are a little bit, you know, well, they are lower level, right? So we expect, we don't expect as much background. We expect that, you know, fresh people who are just newly arrived in university can take them. Uh, we, we may not care whether or not you have a certain kind of background. Uh, we may not care whether you have a lot of preparation. We're going to bring you up to speed. Level two modules may require you to have taken some of these level one modules already. So we kind of expect you to know certain things already. Okay. That, but that, does that make level two modules harder? Not really. You know, as if you do them in the correct sequences, if you don't, like let's like say you're a year one student, you jump straight to a year three module, then you're, of course you're going to crash and burn, right? Because you don't have the correct preparation yet. Right? But when you are there as a year three student, you're done. The first two years, you've done all the other modules that bring you up to speed to that point. So would it be challenging? It better be challenging because why are we offering it as a year three and year four module? It is not challenging. But I, I will be very surprised if it's in a sense, uh, uh, you know, over and above and somehow, you know, you know, it, somehow, you know, it's so challenging that you can't do it. That, that's, that's not the way it works around here, right? Yeah. Yeah. In a, in a similar spirit, uh, you can see that even among the common curriculum <laughs> module, do you really realize that the interdisciplinary module, uh, we desire towards the later stage of your common curriculum modules uh, experience because uh, we want the students to develop a certain uh, foundations knowledge, some some basic knowledge that you already have, and uh, then when you have armed with this basic knowledge and certain foundations, then when you go for the interdisciplinary module, ah. Uh, that is, we find that you will benefit the most. This is where it's most impactful because you already have certain basic knowledge. Then you realize, aha, this is how I uh, discipline X thing of it this way, discipline Y thing of it this way. Yeah. I guess there is also some differences in the modes of yeah. learning and the modes of uh, uh, assessment. For example, in the level 1000, many of them will be lecture, tutorials, and maybe some labs and, and uh, hands on. You, you move on to the level 2000s, you build on the foundation. Like uh, Prof. Loy say, you have to do the prerequisites first because it's on those prerequisites and those foundation knowledge, you will then build them on. Uh, but many of them are still uh, in terms of lectures, tutorials, labs, hands-on learning and so forth, or field trips. But as you go up to the fourth level, level 4000, you will find that many of them will be, all right, we are going to explore this topic you got to read the field, the topic, and the research papers in these areas. And you will probably read them as peer learning. Uh, you present those uh, in presentations. You introduce a new paper, and you criticize, and you critique. So in the modes already, there are some differences. But also, uh, in the, uh, you know, there are differences in the hierarchy of learning. Maybe in the first year, the level 1000 is about making sure you know all the, the, the basic foundation facts and things like that. And maybe you begin to make some connections here and there. But in the level 4000 and level 3000, you need to now say, with the basis that you have, can you now make connections? Can you now make analysis? And in top of all that, can you now create new potential hypotheses that maybe the literature haven't even come up with, but on the basis of all the things that is uh, available already. So 
level 4,000 is that kind of level. Now, if you suddenly a year one student go to the level four, you didn't have the foundation. Yes, like uh, Prof. Loy said, you'll be slaughtered. Yeah. I just, <laughs> just yeah. want to add on because uh, there were a couple of questions which, which I actually have answered with regards to the number of modular credits for the various levels of modules, right? Because some, 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 some of you may be were wondering also, does that mean that for level 4,000 modules, there's actually more modular credits because it's tougher, right? Uh, whereas level 1,000, the number of modular credits is, is lower. But actually, the, the answer is no, it doesn't work that way because the number of modular credits is given for, for passing a module based on the approximate workload or the approximate time that is expected of the student to put in to pass that module. So it's got nothing to do with uh, level one, level two, level three, which we have been explaining. It kind of gives us that scaffolding of knowledge as you build from the foundation to the more uh, depth and specialization kind of modules at, at, your, at your senior years, uh, level three, level 4,000 modules. But by the time you reach level three, level, level four, year three, year four, the amount of time that you spend for that level three or level four module, it's still going to be comparable to how much you would have spent on the level 1,000 module when you were year one per four MC module. So the number of MCs that are given uh, for, for each module, it's not really, it's not dependent on the modules level, but more of the time that we kind of expect students to spend in passing each of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can provide one more perspective on the progression from level one to level four. So in, in level four, I, I think Prof. already alluded to this. Instead of just becoming a consumer of knowledge, you, you contribute back to knowledge. Um, so, you're in, so students at level 4,000 level, uh, a lot of them are involved in some, to, to some extent in research. Uh, you, you, you break new front, you, you, you basically uh, um, get the chance to, to participate in, in, in the scientific enterprise to articulate new research questions. And um, in psychology, for example, we have many um, level 4,000, um, we have many students taking honors projects who are able to turn their projects into um, peer-reviewed publications later on. And I'm sure this happens a lot. Uh, in other disciplines as well. So, so there you, re you really are co-working and collaborating with, with, the, with your professors on, on science. Yeah, yeah I, I would like to echo Prof Yop's point on this. This is very exciting for the students. Think about this, right? So you are you know, contributing to the knowledge, you know, because this is the answer that you found that nobody has previously uh, deduced or found before. Huh? Then you get to uh, tell the world about your discovery, you know, your name gets to appear in the publications. You know, uh, that is, it's very, very rewarding for the students because I contributed to discover new knowledge. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a question about if one doesn't, life science student, uh, one doesn't enter into R&D, what kind of jobs can this degree lead to? I want to actually, okay, I'll, I'll, let me invite uh, Futin to say something, something about that first. I, I, then I'll tell a story about, I actually once employed a life science student, but in a completely not related to life science job before. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lloyd asked me because I'm from the yeah. biology department, which handles the life sciences. Yeah. And actually, life sciences don't. Uh, the graduates from life science don't only uh, work in research. Yeah. Um. And uh, Prof. Uh, Chen Sushin, who is the student life, uh, yes. vice dean, has a very very active uh, uh program where almost every Every two weeks or every week, Shushin, you send out a newsletter, right? Uh, about all the jobs that are available, on, not only for life science, but for science and all that, right? And there's always a whole series of uh, jobs year round. And you can see the diversity. Let me just name a few that I remember seeing from these newsletters that uh, the student life uh, sends out. People can work in the uh, Singapore Health Service. And the key title, for example, in their jobs are what healthcare management executive. Now, what you may think, what is that kind of a job? Well, actually, because you are a life scientist or a life science graduate, you understand the healthcare system. You understand how to package and manage the healthcare system. So I, I remember two of my graduates actually went into this job and they were doing so exciting things in the hospital where they know instead of people going to, oh yeah, if I've got diabetes, I go and see the diabetes doctor. And then suddenly, I, along the way, I said, I, my leg also has got a little bit of a problem. Then they said, sorry, I don't see those. Uh, you've got to go and see the orthopedics one by one. Now, in the hospital, they want to do what they call one-stop management. In other words, they take care of you as a package. 
who do they ask to uh, manage this kind of services? They ask a lot of the graduates who are scientific uh, and life science, uh, 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 familiar with the life science because they know the system, right? You don't want someone who does, what is this? Uh? Uh, diabetes and, and orthopedic, two different things, but you, you don't know what to do with it. Um, so that's one example. There are also people who go into uh, Enterprise Singapore, uh, who are management associates, who manage our Singapore enterprises, especially then today we have so many life science programs and life science businesses. We have our new agency in home team science and technology. You didn't even know that we have such an uh, uh, agency now, right? Home team science and technology, you know. These are where the forensic scientists and the rest of the people come in. We have also other people who work in edit as editors, uh, uh, science centers, thermostic investors, uh, they manage investments, and many, many more. So actually, come in, and we will show you the diversity of areas that you can work in. And this is not just about life science. It's all of HCHS. Yeah. Okay, so I tell two quick stories about two people I personally know. Um, so this is actually a life science graduate who was my first management associate that we hired uh, in a in FASS Deanery under my team, right? Um, yeah, life science graduate, <laughs> okay, you know? And, and my team doesn't do life science, in case you're wondering, right? So I'm for FASS, remember, I'm for us and social science. My, the Deanery, you know, this is, we do, you know, there's communications, there's career preparation, she was very successful management associate in, in the program. Uh, I just had lunch with her recently. Uh, she's going to join MOE to help them design UX, user design, okay? So just give it, again, I'm not saying that, like, you know, that's necessarily the typical or the average. No, of course not. But what I want you to realize is that don't close yourself off. Learn what you learn because you are interested in it. But don't sort of box yourself in and think that, you know, I have to find a job in X because otherwise, why did I learn this? The world is out there, right? Another story, which is coming from all the way from the opposite angle, right? Flossy graduate. Uh, she graduated, I think, 07, 08, one of my students. Uh, she wanted to be an SAA ASD with us. She went through all the stages of interview and then she failed the final physical exam and she also said, King about physical cry. <laughs> okay, you know, why is she today? A very successful life science company head hunter, talent acquisition person working in life sciences, which is completely bizarre, but she's a philosophy graduate working in kind of HR talent acquisition. So here's an interesting thing again. She didn't box herself in. That's the important thing, right? So whatever you do in, in, in NUS, especially in CHS, never ever box yourself in and limit yourself in terms of the possibilities, right? And uh, there was a question about, what about English language and linguistics major? Yeah, our people are employed, so I'm not sure what else to say, right? My advice to you is, if you go on there thinking that, especially if you are from a, a, a more academic subject, you know, history, you know, language, physics, whatever, if you, if you box yourself in and you think that, I, I, I need to find a job that literally has the word physics in the, in the in the in a JD or a, a job that literally have English language in the JD, you know, of course, then yeah, sure, there's only a certain number of these kind of jobs. But you realize that actually your skills are are desirable in many other places. So that's where you need to be a bit more imaginative, right? We have physicists working in banks. We have literature people working as diplomats. We have linguistics people working for research companies. So you know, don't restrict yourself. Learn mm. to appreciate the world. Yeah. Actually, yeah. If, if, yeah, if I may add uh, for, to that, uh, if you look at a lot of the alumni, they are now working in the industry. After four or five years, they might change to different job scopes within their companies or even change companies to different roles. You, you might not stay in your main major kind of job uh, in the next five years after graduation or 10 years. And uh, most of them actually switch to other areas. So you should think broadly and use this CHS experience to help you broaden your perspectives. Huh? Yeah. Uh, case in point, we have a physics graduate. Uh, when he graduated, he worked for Hewlett Packard, HP, right? So it's a very obvious company for a physicist. Yeah. After a few years, now he's at Illumina, which is a company that deals with DNA sequencing. Yeah. Then I asked him, so, so, so what? You, you never learned this? Or, yeah, it's okay. I just pick up a book on DNA sequencing. Then I read up. Then and then I understand. Now he designs the, the machines to uh, help with improve the quality of the sequencing result. Yeah. So very versatile. I think we want our graduate to be very versatile and then can branch to different jobs. Yeah. There's one and thing. Remember, no. And remember, That's these it. are people who they even come from CHS, you know, even in the, this is people who are FSS and FOS. They are really like this. Now mm. you see why we need to create a CHS because we want to make sure that people really and, you know, realize that this is the world we live in, that our best graduates in the past are already doing these kind of sideways moves and this is very natural. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that all our graduates are ready to do that. Yeah, someone did. 
two things you're going to say. I was saying there's one saying, uh, and this uh, encompasses why we create CHS. In the past, it was uh, it, it was my time where my my father was uh, graduating or doing that. They say you graduate and you have a job for life. Today, you will have a life of careers mm. rather than a career for life. Yeah. So think about that. Yeah. Can I help? Because I'm from the English language in literature uh, department. Can I say a little bit about the career prospects of the students? In fact, our students are doing very well. Um, they work in very diverse disciplines like uh, education and finance and uh, journalism and you know, like uh, uh, various you know, uh, corporate PR and various different fields. And really it's up to the student to really explore the possibilities. And in a way, I, I always thought, think that uh, our uh, graduates from the English language and literature uh, department in, a, in some ways um, represent most the uh, kind of versatility of a CHS student. It has always been that way because and people, some people might think, oh, you know, oh, what are you gonna do after studying literature or linguistics or those kind of things. But actually, they're very good at finding new pathways using the specific soft skills that uh, they uh, develop through the, uh, their programs. And that's precisely what CH is trying, CHS is trying to emphasize, right? So uh, rather than kind of preparing you for a very sp specific fixed kind of job, we uh, equip you with, you with uh, very soft skills that are, uh, can be applicable to many different contexts so that you can explore your own pathways, right? So uh, yes, uh, English uh, language and linguistics is a very, um, uh, very flexible program that will allow you to achieve that. Yeah, I think we are pretty much out of time, but anyway, all this is streamed online and it will be available as a recording on Facebook as well. Mm. Yeah, uh, should, do I need to hand it back to uh, Sudarshan? Yeah? yeah, go ahead, please. Hi. Thank you, professors, for the really engaging question and answer session. For those who are tuning in and have more questions, please email them to askchs at nus.edu.sg. All right. So before we conclude, we would like for you to participate in a quick poll. And as everyone takes some time to finish the poll, I would like to highlight some of the other upcoming um, exciting talks we have. So after this, do join us later for a series of talks on the cross-disciplinary programs ranging from data science, environmental studies, and philosophy. Okay, you can join these exciting talks through the links available on the website. Also, later, hear from our student presidents as they share their learning experiences as student leaders as well. And importantly, we will also be having our physical open house on the 14th of May, this coming Saturday. So do come down to experience a slice of our vibrant campus life and to find out more about the majors of your choice. All right. Now that the poll has coming to an end, we have come to an end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you at the other upcoming sessions as well. Thank you so much and we wish you a brilliant day ahead. <laughs>